presenter is Barbara Evil from the New Settables. And uh, Barbara, we consider one of the pioneers on Vancouver Island, I think, Barbara uh. and Lauren both, um, in organic growing food. And um, so Barbara's been doing this for 30 years. And so when she talks about long-term planning, <laughs> <laughs> this is the person you wanna hear from. <laughs> so take it away, Barbara. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation to come over here. Uh, it's always been a favorite place for my husband and me, and we go back a long time. Lauren, to um, a, a, a goose hunter when they opened the road and it was open to goose, hunti uh, goose hunting, I'm told there were 15,000 geese in the area that weekend, and he and his buddy set up their flapping tent on the main street of Tofino and hunted geese. There were hundreds of geese, uh, hundreds of hunters in, and I think the take was 25 birds. <laughs> and after that, the geese got smart and moved somewhere else. But it was a pretty spectacular weekend to have been here. And uh, the other, at that same time, was the opening of the, we were in the overlanders that uh, came into Tofino. Uh, to Interlong into Beach for that weekend. And we came in in blazing, beautiful sunshine. And by evening time, it was pouring rain, it poured rain all night. And we just had a light tent and we all got wet in the morning. Um, we got up and thought, oh good, we'll go and find a restaurant. But um, the people of Tofino were no way um, expecting to welcome us and all the other thousands of people who crossed across on that new road. And so, but in the end, we straggled off to Euclid and we found a, a, um, a, a Chinese family restaurant. I believe it's still there on the main street in Euclid. And they were taking all comers, it was packed with soaking wet people. Um, and the, the thing I remember bo most about it, yes indeed, they serve bacon and eggs and toast and sausages and all those good things, but there was a good two inches of water on the floor and everybody waded around in this two inches of water with. <laughs> so that was, that was our early introduction to, uh, to Tofino and, uh, and Euclid. But about that time we were starting, we had started farming, farming about 30 years ago. I left our jobs in Victoria. Uh, Lauren, after a, a, a very interesting professional career, doing any number of good things, but, but latterly uh, forced research for the Ministry of Ag Ministry Forest. And, um, and I worked for the Ministry of Agriculture after we came back from abroad from 1948 onwards. 48, no, 78 onwards. Let's get this right. I'm not that old. Um, and so 78 onwards. And uh, then uh, we came back into Victoria, worked for the Minister of Agri Ministry of Agriculture <coughs> in policy, and latterly as the um, facilitator of women's programs when, when the status of women legislation was passed. And all during that time, of course, we were working in agricultural policy in the ministry. And uh, so it kind of a natural was, what do we do when we retire? Well, we go farming. And it has been a marvelous experience. Now, where should we go from here? Well, yes, I want to tell you why I'm here at this time, and that is that we've experienced now farming for 30 years, but I think more recently it's, it's more interesting and more exciting because of a number of things. One is that the people of Vancouver Island are, are becoming interested in their local food supply. There are a lot of movements, uh, particularly like this one, which I'm very impressed and thank you so much for agriculture, for both the home gardener and for the professional gardener. I think it's great and, and I think you are leading the way in the fact that you've been able to tie it in with regional and, your, and uh, the, the governance of the area as well as the people. I think it's just grand. Uh, the other thing is um, that there's so much more um, literature about um, the value of 
of quality food and particularly looking not so much as growing a garden but growing a garden that's got really high nutrition and that's what's made me most excited about uh, gardening at this time you can choose you can find out now whether that plant that you're planting is as good as it's supposed to be and um, I think that everybody should have read by now uh, Eating on the Wild Side, Joe Robinson's book about the, the, um, the nutrition that's in their food. And, and she, it's, 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 an, it's pretty much of a lighthearted report, because, um, but she gives you all kinds of good, good information because she takes the, uh, the line of what, the, what it looked like say 25 years ago when most of your food was pretty nutritious because it, it, it hadn't been there hadn't been so much um, involvement <coughs> by plant breeders who were breeding really for the uh, supermarket industry so it wasn't being made big and shiny and sweet and not so bitter uh, it was be, be this these products were made to look good so that people would buy them. But <coughs> what they forgot to tell the plant breeders, it should still have nutrition. And when Joe Robinson looked at it and realized how little nutrition most of it has, that was a huge surprise. And she, if you read the book and you re read the last 20 pages, she's got probably 20 pages of fairly recent proper research reports, scientific reports, comparing the, our f those food items from days gone by and what they are now. And she gives you some good graphs. One of the things I found was kind of amusing, she points out that, <coughs> the, the, that the, <coughs> the vegetables that were probably least changed were artichokes and asparagus, probably because they were on the, totally on the low scale of what pe value of what people were buying. Not everybody buys them, and if they do, probably only occasionally. So the, the, the plant breeders had left them alone, and so they still had the, the nutrition in them that they've always had. I see that Guelph is bringing out two or three new varieties it, the, of, um, uh, of asparagus. Uh, one of them called Millennium, so it will be a little interesting if somebody does some research <coughs> on that and finds out whether, in fact, they drop the nutrition in order to make it prettier. But artichokes really surprised me. I really like them, and they're fun to grow, um, and they're a short-term um, uh, perennial. Uh, but uh, the thing about artichokes is that they um, have phenomenally good nutrition. So if you think about that uh, kind of high-end, kind of uh, foolish kind of a f vegetable, which I've kind of put category I've had it in, um, I was surprised to find that it is seriously nutritious. And it's nutritious in every way. It can be boiled, and it can be steamed, and it can be preserved in salt and water, and it can be preserved in olive oil. Makes no difference. It's still nutritious. So uh, when the, you see that sale on, on artichokes, there's your chance. Now we can move along uh, to, uh, oh yeah, this, that's some of my staff that was last year. And uh, uh, okay, and along. Just a, just a picture of the farm. And here we are at Bees. And um, I, I want to put this in here because I think that we should be thinking about pollinators. Uh, so bees are one of the thing, make delicious honey, and that's grand. Um, they, they pollinate some of your fruit, but not all of it. Most of it, I think somewhere around 65%, is pollinated by your wild critters that live in your garden and on your farm. So it's very important that anybody who cares about food should be caring about um, making space for for pollinators. Um, bees are going, you're, if you have a farmer garden, they're going to get fed. Uh, although they do have a serious problem in the summertime when the 
the the garden is dry because the actual the uh, the the plant actually dries up and they are not although the flowers may be there and the pollen may be there it's too dry to be useful to the the um, the, the pollinators and bees so you have to think about that and think about plants that you can plant that are fairly robust in the summertime and are not so affected by whether or not they get rain. Um, we had a, a, a big cover crop field of Uban clover and, and it was spectacular. I've never heard so many bees. They were just so full, full of, of insects of various descriptions, this field of, of clover, that you wouldn't walk in it. It was, it, they, they occupied it. They were owning it at that time. Uh, funnily enough, the next year, which was one of our first dry years, um, they weren't interested at it, in it at all. So it really taught me a lesson in the fact that if you're, if you're growing for um, pollinators, for bees, for the critters of, that live on your farm with you and have for thousands of years, that uh, you need to have a, a, a really broad variety and use one of the mixes that's put out by people like the Xerxes Society for in the States because they put out varieties for different regions of the continent and um, make sure you keep them growing and that you dedicate space for them. We can go on. So uh, what you have here is, uh, I'm going to assume you folk, I know you do know how to garden and farm, but I'm just going to assume for, from my pers 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 perspective, as I had to prepare this, that you, you don't know about farming and therefore, and particularly home gardening. What I'm trying to do is to have you think about if the, f if the ferry stops running, how are you going to feed yourself? And we can't say, well, somebody is going to airlift food into us. We have no reason to do that. We, it wouldn't even be fair to the peoples of the world to think that that's an okay thing to do because we have every opportunity on Vancouver Island to grow our own food and personally to take that responsibility. So I'm looking at a garden or a farm which takes all those things into consideration and as you're developing it, you're developing um, all of the things you need to be able to feed yourself over time. And though that means that you might not eat them all that day, you might um, uh, dry them or can them or freeze them or turn them into pickles or turn them into coleslaw of some various kinds. Um, but you should know what you're going to do. So one of the things I've done for you is um, I have uh, prepared this, which is I call a wish list. Um, and I've basically taken all of the f vegetables and fruit that are available here in this region over a 12 month period and I put it into two month blocks uh, and including a column on uh, herbs and including a column on, on, on berries and fruits of one, one thing or another. And it's assumed that you're going to store those and you're not ever going to need to go to the store and buy them. So uh, you need to think about your garden as um, things that you have your annu annuals, everybody knows what those are, grow and die in a fairly short period of time in one year. And now, it, does everybody know what a biannual means? Yeah, yes, no? Um, I think they're the, the least understood of any of our food because a bi biannual is such a flexible thing. It's been, it's been bred by farmers and plant breeders over thousands of years, and it's been bred for certain specific reasons to because you must remember that uh, these people up until the last couple of hundred years <coughs> haven't had refrigerators, they haven't had freezers, they haven't had um, glass jars and rings to, um, to be able to put their product into. So somehow or another, they've had to keep it. So keeping it means that you're going to, um, you, you can do it two ways. You can find out a way of storing it that will keep it in good shape. That's one way. But you can also use your 
pl your plant breeding skills, and you could you can select for the kind of, of fruit or vegetable that keeps well. It may, may keep well by drying, but it may keep well because you've got a kind of a brushy haystack kind of thing, or you take all your vegetables, say, say your melons and things of that nature that well, squashes and all those things that have a harder core, uh, a harder surround, and you breed it for um, water resistance and for something that will keep relatively dry and won't spoil. Uh, so if you think about, I don't know whether any of you get the American Seed Savers catalog, do you? Well, that is a, a supremely, I think I, I have one here, I'll show you in a bit. Um, yeah, that is a supremely amazing catalog because it has pages of um, melons and squashes and all these kinds of things. And, it, and, and when you test them out, and you, are, uh, you, you can put them on your counter in your sales area. And lo and behold, there, if it hasn't sold, it'll be there in two weeks' <coughs> time, and it'll be ha perfectly happy you haven't done anything. You haven't put it in the fridge. You haven't done anything to it. It's there. And I think that's where, the, what, where that word watermelon comes from, because the varieties of watermelon, they, they could sit for two, three weeks or more. Um, in, in your shop, and they don't seem to have a firm, hard shell. They seem to have a, th a leathery th th shell on them, and you break them open. And apparently, what the First Nations people did with them is that they, they drilled a hole in, like people do with a coconut, and they swished a stick around inside it and they drank it. So that could be drunk at any time in the wintertime. It didn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily a summer, summer vegetable, which I think is quite amazing. Um, so now we should go, oh, and that's, so I want to tell you about this map. And this map is going to be, you're going to walk around your garden or, or your, 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 your space that you're going to garden in, and you're going to watch for the, um, sun where it is at various times, spring and, su and winter, summer, and f figure out where, your, where, where the warm spots are, where you've got some good soil and the warm spots, and you're going to reserve those for the, your perennial plants, the plants or fruits and vegetable fruits and vegetables that require long seasons and require some protection from the weather, perhaps winds if you're in a windy spot or whatever. You, you're going to choose those. Um, you don't need to grow a huge amount of anything at once. What you want to grow is variety. So we're going to gradually put together this uh, this uh, um, map. And you're going to keep the map, and you do do work with pencil, and you're going to move things around until you've got them all in the proper place, so that you're going to have your um, year-round garden. Okay, let's go on. So this is just to remind you that that annuals are grand, and we grow masses of them because we're greens growers. But what we like to do is to move them on from place to place and in the, in the garden so that we can put the transplant biannual, biannuals, what we, which we have waiting, into those places. So we rototill that up and put your biannuals in. So they're often out before we <coughs> need to actually place the biannuals, which then are going to live later on into the year. Okay. And so um, I've got here a number of, um, of catalogs, and um, I just wanted you to be aware that the, probably the best thing that you could read um, for, for pl planning a garden are the seed catalogs. Have you ever read through one actually as a book? They are amazing because they tell you everything you need to know about that vegetable and, and, or that fruit, and they will... Um, they will t what the thing I find really th amazing about them is that you can plan your garden. You take something like a broccoli, for instance. Mostly it says that it grows between 60 and maybe 90, 80, 90 days. That doesn't mean that's the only time you can grow broccoli. You can have them started and put them in the ground right now. And you can put them in the ground every month um, until, until uh, probably August. <coughs> 
September even for the fall varieties. So you could conceivably have six plantings of broccoli. So none of them needs to be very big. Then you can look at something like Brussels sprouts, for instance, another biannual. And that biannual, will um, you can plant it all on the same day because it might have a 65-day to, to ripening um, variety. So you're going to be planting that sort of early summer. But it might have a 200-day variety, which means you'll be picking it now. So you don't have to plant it in three different places at three or four four different times, you actually can plant it all in, the, in your Brussels sprout garden, but you're going to be taking them out monthly as they ripen. And now that applies to other, uh, other vegetables as well. That's why I love biennials. You can do uh, four varieties of leeks, for instance, all planted on the same day, but coming off through your, throughout the year, which is going to give you a good, healthy food um, over a good part of the year. It works the same with cauliflower. If you look at cauliflower in, in the winter, winter section, for instance, of um, West Coast seed, you'll find that you've got all your different times of the year for summer, summer bearing cauliflowers up until fall. But you've also got three varieties that have 200 days as they're to ripening, which means that they, take a, they, they rest and grow and put on roots until, until uh, winter solstice. And then they sort of sit down for a month and do nothing. And as soon as the dates, uh, the times start to change and it gets a little lighter in, the, in, in January, they turn around and grow in, in one month they're ready to be picked. Um, so it, it means that you can have all, all the fun you want with a, an enjoyment from all kinds of, uh, of biannual vegetables. And it's just a matter of knowing whether this is one that you are going to have to re plant repetitively uh, throughout the season or whether you can choose to plant it once. Of course, uh, ca cabbage, which has become fashionable again, thank goodness, it's good stuff. Um, that is, um, that comes in groups of, of spring, summer, su and then summer uh, to late summer, and winter varieties. So you, you do need to plant those in three. And they're very carefully, if you read carefully in your catalog, you'll see that all um, uh, set out for you. Um, I keep a gardening catalog. I keep, I keep a gardening workbook, and, and I keep all those things in here. So the pages that I want for you would, would have one for, for kale, for instance. Kale is a, uh, is a, is a biannual that, that usually needs to be planted twice in the year, needs to be planted in the spring for summer and fall harvest. And by that time, hopefully, it's been harvested to death and you don't need it anymore and you can take it out and put something else in there. But it also can be planted in the summertime, perhaps June, and put in the uh, garden by, by August. And by August, um, it, those those are the ones we're cutting now for our customers, and we also have masses of it, and we cut it. And it's, the plants are only about 10 inches tall, and there's hardly anything on them. But every week, they return all that nice small stuff that you can, you can put into your uh, nutritional greens for wintertime. So you do get a full year's production out of kale if you manage it right. Uh, and that one is collard, uh, that's collards, that's my favorite food. We lived in the tropics and people who have no <laughs> access to meat at all eat, uh, eat soup type things uh, along with, with collard greens. And I must say they, uh, they look grand on it and they are stay nice and healthy, that's good stuff. This is your, call. This, is your th this was kind of a joke. You could go on it. It's okay. Uh, you can play them some. Of the, oh, yeah. Well, they're talking about exactly what I'm talking about there. So, okay, that's good. Um, um, 
this was the, this was the, uh, the, the, the breeding program backfired in January because these very, very expensive cauliflowers had been, had been um, grown for that post uh, uh, Christmas market and it had been grown in huge abundance obviously in all the agricultural regions in, in, in North America. The only thing that they didn't find, didn't realize that there was going to be a, 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 a monetary crisis that month and they, they brought all, you know, trucked all these cauliflower all over the continent only real to realize that people weren't spending and we, they, they were charging the full price for them in the beginning but uh, in the end uh, they were selling them off because they couldn't get rid of them but it is it is an indicator what the plant breeders have been able to do they just won't do that again um, in um, in Okay, well we can, that's where, that's where I want you to be. Um, do, does everybody have a copy of West Coast Seed Catalog? Because that's the catalog that gives you the most help um, in being able to choose when you're going to plant your seeds and when you're going to be able to harvest. And remember that uh, you have a lot of fle flexibility, especially if you're into a, a seed that has a fairly short distance to time from transplant to harvest. Uh, when you look at that number uh, in, in the catalog, do you, know what, do you know what that number actually means? It means that, that you, have, you have to have a good transplantable plant in your hand when you look at that number. It's not when you put the seed in the ground, it's when you put the transplant in the ground. So if you're out by however long it takes you to buy that seed and to get it pit seeded and grown on to a decent transplant, then you're probably going to miss that opening of the days to harvest and you might out drop into winter and you, you didn't actually get, you didn't get any reward from that plant because you were out of sync with the timing because these plant breeders are pretty um, accurate as far as this timing is concerned. Um, one of the things you need to re 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 remember is that if you're growing, we're going to leave um, uh, biannuals, my favorite subject for the time being, but we are going to talk about um, uh, plant, pa plants and how the vegetables and how they behave for you. Uh, you need to look carefully <coughs> at your on any onions that you grow because they can be planted in the fall and be overwintered onions, but they will tell you so in your catalog. So look carefully when you plant onions. You can plant them in the, sp in the early spring and use them as transplants and then they will bear that year and they'll tell you how long it takes. And then you can plant tra them as actually seed them into the ground, uh, thin them out as you go along for, um, uh, for use as green onions. And, uh, and then finish them off by as they grow large enough. They won't grow huge, but they will grow large enough to use. So onions are a great thing to grow, but you should probably, uh, as you stake them and put their name on them, you should probably put the, the harvest date so you know whether you can leave them in the ground, har harvest them that fall, or leave them in the ground until the following spring because there are the three varieties of, of onions. Um, vegetables which I think that people are, are becoming, um, what's that one? Hmm, oh look, that <laughs> there I'm growing, I'm growing uh, summer transplants and uh, it's raining outside, I've got my rain hat on. <laughs> um, yeah, a couple of vegetables that uh, if you haven't used um, that I would re recommend that you try. And one is, the, is kohlrabi. Do you people grow kohlrabi? Yeah, that's, it's a great vegetable. And it, if you buy the um, open pollinated 
variety. You won't get that little bitty thing that you get in the store, but you can get something that's the size of a good sized turnip. And it's wonderful as a coleslaw, and you can do all manner, manner of different things with it. But I think it's William Dam seed that has about four or five varieties of uh, kohlrabi, and um, that I do recommend them. Okay, we can, we can go on. What did I, what's that? Oh, yes, tools, okay. <laughs> uh, tools, tools. Um, I, I want, uh, uh, this is, this is, a, this is a, a nice tool rack that a, a woofer youngster, young, young guy came along and said, I want to build you a tool rack. And he did a splendid job of it. It's about um, 40, 50 feet long. And it has uh, spikes on either side, so we can put things orderly along there. And then on the very end, it's got maybe a meter, meter and a half of um, just just the the the, band, the the piece of wood just extends out there. And what he put that there in order that um, you could uh, put um, your hang your hoses on it. So if yes, you find a piece of hose, and of course there's always hoses on the ground somewhere, you just roll them up and hang them over there. It's a great, so that's a great design for, for a tool rack. Okay, we can go on. Oh yeah, well it gets to be winter time. I just thought <laughs> you can see the place when it's really bare. Um, it's there probably all kinds of things planted in there, but it uh, does look kind of pathetic in the winter time. But not this last two winters. The, the crop has gone right through the winter and we haven't lost uh, anything to, to frost. So you just never know for sure what you should be planting. Okay, we can go on. Uh, there we are. Uh, the, this is... Uh, um, rad, ra raspberries up the back there, and this field that that, uh, that now is in um, I here in vegetables is now in uh, strawberries. <laughs> strawberries, uh, seascape. Hmm, can't remember the other one. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> picking greens. <laughs> this is what it looks like in the summertime, picking greens. <laughs> Lauren keeps saying we need to mechanize, and I keep saying no, 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 no. Um, but I, I can see the value of, of mechanization, but I have to look at, at um, their food value, because there's not a lot of food value in small annuals. They're mostly water. You, it, you may think you're getting something really valuable from that early mixed lettuce they call spring greens, but in reality, you are not. So what we do with our greens is we pick nutritional greens, which has all manner of uh, biannuals in it, but we keep them cut down into little small plants, which we shave off. Um, and so that, that um, we, I, it doesn't work. It's not going to work with a machine because it has the wrong mix. And I don't want to just serve to people a green that we call a nutritional green when in fact it's just come out of the ground and it hasn't had time to bring its nutrition with it. All those minerals and nutrition that are in the soil are still sitting there waiting to enter the plant as the plant grows. So I am the, my figuring is, and I am not a scientist, um, the, is that you use the, keep using the same plant but you um, uh, keep it cut short so that it gives you the size of, gre of green that you're looking for. Okay, oh, look at this. What have we got here, fruit? This is just to, <laughs> uh, this, is, this is just a pretty picture of fruit on the farm. Uh, I have a person on the farm who just thinking, how, how, what do you do with this fruit? What do you do with an overabundance of um, plums, for instance? It's a hard thing, particularly if, thought they're, if they're not what I'd call canning type plum, plums. Uh, but it is, but, but uh, surely she can think of, always think of something to do with, with uh, all the fruit and vegetables we have. And she, she, we have those juicers that steam juice. 
and she'll put anything into them that we've got. And then she has, she has um, uh, quartz sealers, which she has ready to go. Um, and it gets put in the quartz sealer and it's sealed down and there it is. It's, it's pasteurized at that stage. And you can use it for any manner of things all through the winter. So it, it's, you certainly don't have to consider that that fruit is a throwaway or that it's something that can only be frozen. Uh, the other thing that we, we did this year is that we had, we had apples like crazy. Uh, we have uh, apple trees that were put in about 25, 30 years ago, so they're not very fashionable varieties and they're not very easy to sell. Uh, because they're not pretty like the ones in the supermarket. So what we, um, what we did this year, we used pressing matters at, at, at uh, uh, Courtney. Have anybody been there? It's so much fun to go, you just have to go and look. If you've got anybody who's got an apple tree that they're just wasting the apples, take, just box them up and take them up there. Or they do go around all over this northern part of the island uh, to different places. So if you look them online, uh, you'll find them. That's where I found where they were going to be. But they were actually at their home farm at the time that I went. And there must have been a dozen people went through there that day with their boxes of, of apples. And it goes through the whole, they wash them and then it goes through a, a one of these lovely contraptions that takes them to this station and to that station and that station and in the end they goes through the pasteurizer and it put, turns them out into a box and they call your name and you go around and pack up and pick them up. So much fun. Um, and <laughs> you get juice. Yeah, you get juice like crazy. Yeah, it's really wonderful. So, um, so I think we had, we, we actually turned out 48 uh, five liter boxes of juice. And we sold them inside of a week. I br I, we're going to have some tonight. I brought, I brought some. But, um, so, okay, here we are. We're in the garden. We're coming to the end. This is, uh, I don't know what they're picking. It looks like lettuce. And, oh yes, and the, the, the royal family here, uh, we, we, we run pastured um, hens and one rooster. This is about, um, and we move it around the farm and use it to clean up crops. So they either eat crop that we cut down or they're moved to that location and they clean up the, lo the location. We, ha we started with 200, but the owls <laughs> got quite a few. And they're very hard. You can't do anything about an owl. It simply comes in and they're too slick to be able to capture them or do anything. You, you eventually, you just have to do netting and all kinds of crazy things to, and they eventually get tired of you, I think. I find all, all predators and birds and uh, mo all these birds, they will bother you to death until finally one day they said, well, you know what, we're gonna lose our heads if we don't get out of here. And they kind of just back off, uh, and they eventually do. But. Um, uh, they, they, they certainly had lots of uh, hens as a result of that, that little episode. And there we are, that's Marion berries. And they're my favorite fruit. Um, and what I like about Marion berries is when you get them nice and black and you pop them in the freezer and when you take them out, that kind of bitter edge is gone. It's turned it into sugar and they're most deliciously sugar, sugary things, and they bear like crazy. So they're really nice to have, and I used to put them into the size that I needed for my, for my lunch um, for at work, and uh, every, every day I looked forward to my lunch. It was so good. They, these days, um, what they're, um, the, the, the berry that's being grown and really touted for nutrition is what they call a thornless blackberry. Anybody tried it? It's a huge plant. I mean, they just blow you away. It's a cross between a blackberry and a, and a raspberry, but I don't know where this gigantic raspberry come. It's a raspberry leaved, but much stronger and bigger. And uh, you will, so only buy one. <laughs> you don't want to buy one because you can break it up. You do, you, it's, they're, they're, they're tough and they're big and they'll stand on their own, on their own canes. 
And, uh, uh, and if you look in, um, if you read in the Eating on the Wild Side, you will find that it's considered to be the most nutritious of the fruit. So it's a good reason to have it. You only need one in your garden. You don't need a lot. So when you uh, plan this garden, plan an assortment of, of berries and an assortment of fruits. Be sure to put in some rhubarb. Be sure to put in some good old-fashioned apples that have lots of nutrition. Look, the, look at the list and find out what you need to grow. Um, grow for nutrition because the nutrition, the nutritious um, fruit will taste great as well. Nice and strong flavored and, and likely keep well. And there we are, a pretty picture of transplants going into the ground. <laughs> We've got time for a question or two. Anybody? Yes? What sort of um, uh, manures or um, compost, or what are, you, what are you feeding the soil? All those things. A real nature. Yeah, yes. We, we try to plant um, alternate plant in this one garden, which we call the Greens Garden, which is directly out of front. Mostly it works, and we've got uh, broad beans in it right now, which are, remember, 26% protein. Uh, I mean, you can't beat that. And the tops of them, of course, become really, really good mulch. So you rotate that in, and then you plant on it right away because it will gradually break down, it'll feed your next crop. Mm -hmm. And if when you finish that, you, you can rototill that crop down and you can put fall biennials in there. So you don't actually have to think about adding manure okay. to that crop. Just make sure that the, our, our soil is a little bit weak in boron. Uh, I have to remember to add it in. You don't give that to your staff to, to any of those things that are classified as minor elements, uh, you don't give them to your staff to take care of, you actually take care of them yourself, Lauren and I do those kinds of things. Boron and sulfur. So those are the two that uh, t tend to, I think they get gobbled up in the crop that's going out, you know, because we're harvesting all the time. So a lot of our nutrition just disappears along with the, uh, along with the crop that's being harvested and carried away. Uh, the other thing we use is uh, al um, alfalfa, and we, bought, we buy that from Integrity Enterprises in Victoria, and we, uh, we sort of top dress with that down, down in between the transplants to give them some additional nutrition. Uh, we use sea soil, uh, which we always have, and we actually market it as well. Um, it has some drawbacks, but in our, our light soil, um, there's just no way that we could get enough nutrition steadily into the soil because we just had the chickens and there's not enough of them to do anything seriously well. So we uh, would use that um, as a top dressing uh, to an inch or two so that it could be holding the soil in place um, in rain and sunshine and so on. It helps to to uh, keep the soil in decent condition and keep it bare. Uh, and then we, we, we cover crop in between. So it's a, it really depends on what you're looking at there in soil. If it appears to be growing well and it's in good shape um, and we've got some time to grow some other crop in it, uh, particularly if we can put a legume crop of any sort into it, we do grow br dry beans. So the dry beans are helpful in that you pick them and then you rototill the crop in. So it acts as similarly to a cover, cover crop. Where do you get your soil tested, Barbara? Uh, Lawrence the expert. Where do we send our soil test? Langley. <coughs> 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 their name. Langley. No, I've been Langley. Okay. There's, there's no way to get, uh, obtain boron naturally if buy it from the store, is it? Well, we have it, we have it in our block supply and add it in, in the appropriate amount if we are, we, we actually, um, 
have a Mazzi injector, so any field that's, that's on drip irrigation, which is almost the entire farm, uh, we could add it in a very minor amount in that. If we were add adding it to uh, beds that were going to be, um, uh, be given some, like alfalfa or lime or something, we would add it into that in a very, mi very minor amount and we would d use laundry borax for that because yeah, we don't want no the natural source of borax. No, not that I know of. No, I, have, I, have I haven't read about it. So let's see if this, that, oh yes, well that's, that's the end. <laughs> and I, but I am here to take any questions. So what kind of greens for your um, nutritious greens that like you said by your uh, biennials that you keep small? Yeah. Which kind? Like what are some examples? Oh, oh, oh goodness. <laughs> yeah, this, you could take one each of these or all. If you want to pick, this is for you to make. Please, please remember. To, I want you to that if you don't have a gardening journal, there's some really good starts here, and, and this is two. This is a um, for the two seasons. Yeah. Just a little reminder for any of you who enjoyed this and would like to see more. Um, if you help us at Chapino Community Food Initiative by making a donation, if you haven't paid for the whole weekend.